So uh, guys, I've got uh, Mike back on the channel. It's been quite some time that he's actually been on mine. It's uh, me being on his most recently. So yeah, we're going to be talking today about the Symphony Age. It's from the True Age test. It's just from there complete. And the Symphony Age, it looks at various different uh, organ systems. There's 11 of them. So we're going to go over Mike's results and then just talk about them in a bit more detail. So yeah, it's good to have you. Yeah, back. thanks for having me back. I've been looking forward to going over my Symphony Age because that's the newer test that you're offering. Yeah. And I like it better than the other test that you had showed me. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Because we looked at Mike's Omic Age and the, the, that looks at decades and decades, your whole life of epigenetic changes. So things you might have been doing when you were 18, 25, that maybe weren't so healthy are going to show up in your overall biological age. Whereas something like your Danundin Pace, or as we're going to talk about today, the Symphony Age, that's more looking at your kind of current health span, your trajectory. So in Mike's case, he's actually looking really good, both in his uh, Danundin Pace, his pace of aging at 0.81. So that's a really, that's a good number. That's yeah. well below... It's getting yeah, close to Brian Johnson. So yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. If you do a few more changes, then Mike's keen yeah. to do a, a repeat test because that was, I think, back in, if I remember right, April. Yeah, and I have made some changes since yeah. then, so I'd be curious to see what it is. But mm -hmm. I'm not going vegan like uh, like Brian Johnson uh, and, uh, and, I mean, and living like a monk. <laughs> That's what my girlfriend keeps yeah. complaining about, that I'm living too much like a monk. I, I test every quarter. Yeah. And then, the month leading up to that, uh, yeah, strict. Yeah, yeah, I'll get really strict. So I'm only having like a few percent animal protein. So she's like, "God, I couldn't, I couldn't live like that." <laughs> but yeah, it's about having a bit of flexibility, yeah. you know, like not not to be too much like a monk, as you say. Yeah, well, I'm I'm having steak three times a week, but it's the grass fed steak oh, from okay, uh, yeah. from Lidl. They've got some nice grass fed, oh, right, yeah, yeah. you know. But you know, it's each his own, right? You, you, you don't have to do uh, less animal protein. I think it depends on on your on you. But yeah, I think there's, there's trying to get that balance, is it, where you're having good quality meat and then so you know where the, you know, the, the kind of food it's been fed and then, um, yeah. yeah, then I guess not having too much of it either. Yeah, portion control makes a big difference. That's I've, it, I've yeah. cut back. I, I was going to get to the point, even with some of the sugars, I was, you know, a little bit of honey on this and a bit of honey there and maybe this carb with, uh, with a small piece of sourdough bread because sourdough isn't as bad as on, on the gluten side of things. Okay, but, yeah. Um, now I'm, I'm kind of like watching if I'm if I'm having a bit of uh, sourdough toast for, for with breakfast and eggs, I might skip the porridge that day, you know, and try to try and change it up a bit. Instead of having that little bit of honey with the porridge, I just leave it out now. So oh, okay, yeah, smart, yeah, little things. Yeah, and then like the blood blood sugar control is probably the the easiest thing you can do. Well, it's easier said than done. Yeah. But we'll have a look at your symphony okay. age here. So your overall symphony age, we were just talking about a minute ago, and that was. So your current age is 40, sorry, your... Current age is 50, but at the time of the test, it was 49. Yeah, and a half. 49 and a half, okay. Oh, yeah, because I think what it does is it rounds it up. So yeah, that's why, yeah, because it does, you know, have your... So if you're close to 50, yeah, you're oh, right, up to 50. Yeah, to make right. it rather than doing like decimal points. Okay. So yeah, so you've got like a three year age delta, so you're three years younger than right. chronological, so that's, that's pretty oh, good going right. already. I guess it's better than being three years older. Exactly, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've got a few of mine where I'm older. There's not many that I'm younger, there's a couple, okay. but yeah, it's, it's a slow process. But yeah, in particular, your lung age is like 39 years old. Oh, I'll take that, I don't smoke. <laughs> yeah. So, got yeah. an air, air filter. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and so they, they, all these different 11 bodily systems, you've got metabolic age, musculoskeletal age, blood age, liver age, inflammation age, kidney age, heart age, hormone age, immune system age, and brain age. Yeah, well, they, will, they will have individual biomarkers that adds up to 133 overall. They, they will okay. monitor different things. But I mean, yeah, like the brain age, I'm quite keen on because it even looks at, you know, BDNF levels, yeah. brain-derived neurotrophic. What does it say about mine? Yours is actually bang on chronological 50. Okay. Well, so yeah, that's uh, nothing that. to worry about. But yeah, the, like I say, these I things. I was surprised could, on the muscle. Uh, it said. The muscle's good. Is uh, it good? It said 10. 42. Okay. 42, yeah. If you jump onto that, so the, what it's actually reading. So musculoskeletal, I think we were talking about a minute ago. So if you look at all the bar markers. Right. And those are part of that. Okay. You know, you've got uh, D3 levels. Right, that's a, which are quite good, I think. But I mean, the, when the, when they gathered the data, it was just a, a, a spot of blood on a card. Yeah, so, you, they, yeah, so you've got like a big blood sort card, and then yeah. obviously from that, 
going to look at methylation patterns for certain gene CPG sites that relate to, say, vitamin D levels. Right, but they're not actually looking at your vitamin D3 levels. No, 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 no. that's it's, Yeah, it would be impossible with that yeah, little blood spot. The, yeah. the amount of things they're looking at from that. <laughs> no, that's right. It's not like that one company that got done for promising to have all biomarkers with just one drop of one blood. Drop yeah. Of blood. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Theranos or something. Yeah, like that. that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so, yeah, it's quite interesting when you talk about these epigenetic biomarker proxies. Uh, I was looking at, speaking with Ryan from True Diagnostic the other day, actually, and then, so when you're looking at, say, albumin levels or HbA1c and then when you're actually looking at those uh, biomarker proxies of that he was saying they're actually more indicative of health outcomes than the actual clinical factors but I guess the reason why is just because it's, it's less of a snapshot in time it's more of a longer trajectory so you get a bit more feedback. So we're actually looking at the epi epigenetic markers biomarkers rather yeah. than yeah. rather than the actual clinical um, lab result. Yeah so I guess the clinical lab result would you'd get probably more of an like a current snapshot so that's why right. i think when we looked at your omic age before it was you know you'd get like an hbo1c and then that wouldn't necessarily be the same oh if i te i tested my hbo1c that day it wasn't exactly the same but it's not looking it's not meant to be a replacement for a blood test it's meant to give you like an indication of how that that bar marker is in like a longer kind of trajectory. So you're not gonna, it's not gonna give you an exact kind of like number that you can really, it's not replacing blood tests. It just gives you areas to look at weaknesses epigenetically that um, you can focus on. And which is, which tallies up with myself. When we talk about HB1C, mine was looking pretty good, but my fasting glucose on that um, test, yeah. it was actually looking bad. It was like in the top 97th percentile. Were you really fasting? Yeah, yeah, and I was, and then obviously that's not, yeah, and then looking at it, it, interestingly, my fasting glucose was pretty bad, actually, I was coming in at like six. Oh, on the one we did through, through, oh, hormones, so that test you're referring um, to, or you're talking about the, oh, yeah, the, the, in the omic, omic, your omic test, yeah, yeah, omic yeah, test. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, so when I was doing my daily yeah. morning um, glu glucose readings, I was coming in around six quite frequently, okay. 5.56, yeah. and yeah, so that actually tallies up with that, where I was actually for some reason, this the food I'm eating, there's things that's setting me off glucose wise, getting these spikes. Yeah. But then, um, yeah, now I've managed to massively close that up through my protocol. But yeah, you look good. So you know, I don't think you have to worry. Yeah, and, and that's some what, the other biomarkers are really good uh, on point. So. Yeah, yeah. So, like, I guess that's why that's why I'm interested in all these tests is by because, as you say, epigenetically, there might be areas that, oh, I, I didn't know that I was doing badly there. And then it gives you an area to focus on. Uh, you know, in the next few months, I, you know, I'm going to retest that as a clinical blood test and just see what's what's wrong with that. What can I do to adjust that rather than spending, you know, doing an, another biological age test straight away. You, okay. you just gives you areas to focus on just on those individual biomarkers through your blood. Okay, so just get more symphony age tests then along. Yeah, the, the, well, the symphony age now is part of the a complete. Part of it, okay. It's part of the complete test now. It's, it's like built into it. Right. And yeah, so I guess because um, previously you'd only, I, I would focus more on, you know, the pace of aging, but now you've got this, so you can kind of give you a real snapshot of things that you can change at a quicker rate. With different organ systems, different, yeah. like, the, like it's laid out rather than just the, the pace of aging. But the pace of aging is now there's sort of this competition of who has a lower pace of aging. Yeah. And now they're even introducing a competition with the symphony age as well. Okay. So I think uh, it's on the same leaderboard, but uh, I haven't I've been yet to see what they're actually, I think it's coming very soon, what they're actually measuring against, because it's a bit harder. Pace of aging, just one number, whereas this is, what do you measure against your biggest age delta? Maybe I'm guessing that's what it would be, something like that. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Interesting. <laughs> it's a whole new area that um, I think they're still trying to work out the, the right metric to, to measure. And then how, how, do you, how do you move the needle on it? Yeah. Yeah, this is a so many different ways you can measure biological age, and uh, it just gives you another area to really like to focus on. No, it's all right. Just what it's like the Brian Johnson says: just don't die. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I just want to live well. I just want to be healthy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's why I'm a big big fan of these ones that are predictive of health span. So that that omic age I, we talked about previously is looking more at um, uh, it's more of a it's a better clock for mortality prediction. I think it's 92% yeah. accurate in the next 10 years. Whereas 
these these two we're talking about the Danoon and Pace and the Symphony Age are more of a health span calculator. Yeah. So just things that biomarkers that would indicate you know you're going to have poor health. True, but and then it's, and then you could do something about it. Hopefully, to turn yeah, it around yeah, trajectory. Yeah. yeah. And then so you've got people like me that maybe have not been, or both of us really, yeah. that have not been, maybe in our younger years, we've not been the most healthy of individuals. And now we're making changes and seeing some good numbers, but then our, our overall biological age isn't the best. But. Yeah, I mean, when we're younger, there's all different time points, right? In my early 20s, I was very fixated on adding lean muscle mass. And I was doing everything from the ketogenic diet or a version of that in, in my twenties. And then, um, then also adding a lot of muscle mass and a bit more bulking and wasn't quite as cut as I could have been, mm -hmm. you know, mixed in with some periods of, you know, going out, drinking big dinners, big corporate meals and things like this. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I kind of fell off the bandwagon for a little bit in my, uh, probably late twenties, early thirties, got busy you know, renovating properties and just, just busy between work and, and other, other activities. And then I think in my mid thirties, I went through a period of very focused, like kind of like you, uh, got in really, really good shape for the time. And, and then was doing the six small meals a day is six small meals a day, really the healthiest option. I'm not, I'm not always sure because, um, you're always taxing your system to process, something you know the, sh the blood sugar is constantly up yeah. in, in that regard but then you're hoping you're getting get enough protein to maintain yeah. the muscle and mass also you're not having a huge meal that maybe could cause a bit of oxidative so stress and uh, that's supposed to be the benefit small or frequent meals because that's what you're seeing in, in lots of bodybuilding contests but is that you know as we start getting older now i'm doing three meals in a snack or three or four meals small four reasonable sized meals and that mm -hmm. seems to be fine i don't know if I need to go up to any more than that, but some people still do to, to try to keep the muscles full, you know, in, enhance the muscle, muscle glycogen. But yeah, there, there were times when in my lifestyle that yeah, I was, I would had, I would drink alcohol was there as a big part of it. And I think that was the removing that for me was, was, was very helpful in how I feel my mood. And as I found as I got older, I don't metabolize alcohol that well. I don't think anyone really does, no. but I, just like how I felt the next day. And so mm -hmm. I've stopped all that. And, you know, there's so many facts, things that you can do, but I think it happens in cycles. I mean, we're not angels. None of us are meant to, you can't live so perfectly from a young age. No, there's no, there's only a few people that maybe. That and why would you? It's, yeah. you don't know this. And then you just go through these cycles and not mm -hmm. right now. I think you're on a healthy cycle. I'm on a healthy cycle. I hope to stay on one, mm -hmm. but I don't know. I think, I think, that's the hope, right? That we that we stick with it, and that it doesn't become a burden, and it, you don't become so fixated on it that you lose track of what's important in life yeah. as well. Yeah, but, it's like getting that balance, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. And I guess most people, as you say, haven't been super like living like a monk their whole life. So they're going to be areas that they need to improve as they get older, and that's why I think it's just a learning journey, isn't it? Where little by little, you know, you learn what's important, what's not, because you know, like you can be. 100% healthy but then that's gonna you know trying to cut out every little bad thing out of your diet and then it just yeah. drives you crazy but then but at the same time like when you go out sometimes you, you can let your hair down and enjoy it and other times you might say well you know is this going to give me the, the pleasure that I want or maybe I'll just order a salad with chicken or you know maybe I'll have you know the duck leg and and not get the chip and uh, fish and chips mm. right so duck and maybe some mash and maybe some greens and that's you know, not not as clean as maybe a salad and chicken, but still yeah, not as dirty as fish and chips or maybe a yeah. big bowl of bolognese, which isn't necessarily unhealthy, but again, it depends on you, you know, what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah. And I think, yeah, it's just a learning process, isn't yeah. it, where you just learn your body's limits. That's why doing these kind of doing tests in general, whether it's a blood test or an epigenetic test, you just get to see over time what is actually happening and what is my diet at the moment and what, what moves the needle and improving things and that spurs you on so the, you know when you start going down that path and i've had this happen in stops and starts but when i get into that that zone where i see some progress i see things are going well i don't want to sabotage it necessarily mm -hmm. so that's when i would you know if i'm going out for a meal find healthier choices to still enjoy the so you know being social being around other people eating as healthily as i can without feeling like I'm giving something up. And I even had a, you know, like the other night, I had a sticky toffee pudding for dessert, but I didn't eat too badly for the, for the main, so. Yeah, and I guess by being, 
rational with your portions, then you you kind of learn like not to when you do have it, you know, you don't go to oblivion, you know, you just have a reasonable portion. Yeah. Whereas if you're having it every day, then it becomes normalized. And then what seems like a, a normal portion is it, is it in reality bigger, gets get, yeah. get bigger and bigger. <laughs> yeah, that's like with pasta. People say, oh, I don't eat pasta at all. And I've, I've reincorporated a bit of pasta in my, uh, but then it kind of fluctuates because you're right, it's easier for that to get with, yeah, I'll do one cup, no, maybe two, maybe I'll do three cups of dry pasta. Or maybe I'll make the whole bag, but then I'll save it for tomorrow. But then it's easy to get out to control the pork because then, you know, because rice doesn't hold over well the next day unless you really cook it well the right. next day. Otherwise, you can get some sort of food poisoning if you're not careful. Um, you can go very, very low carb, not do, you know, just do your greens and a, and, a, and a protein. Sometimes sweet potatoes, but other people are concerned about the oxalates and there's some, mm. you know, damage to the kidneys with two, you know, sweet potatoes all the time. That's your staple carb. Um, normal potatoes, I, I guess anything in, in moderation. Yeah, it's quite hard to pick the right carbs, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I think, it's, as you say, it's just maybe not focusing too much on any particular food, trying to just get a broad yeah. range of things and then... I always do uh, protein as a base, some sort of protein, mm -hmm. um, maybe a, a smaller portion of complex carbs and then a larger portion of, of greens. Yeah. And that's usually kind of the, the rule I follow. Yeah, so yeah, mainly yeah, like half half a plate of vegetables basically as we're kind of... Uh, Right, yeah, yeah that's yeah, a nice tiny nice. bit of carbs and then the protein. Yeah, yeah. I'll even drizzle it with some olive oil. That's it, yeah. So get me hungry now. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, anyway, I don't want to take the whole thing up about food and nutrition, yeah. but it's just one of those aspects that mm. is, you know, sleeping, eating, you know, sex, <laughs> all a part of what we do, right? 